Okay, so welcome everyone to this presentation, which will be about learning automated intrusion response. My name is Kim, and this is joint work together with Rolf. We consider an IT infrastructure that consists of a set of connected components, which jointly provide services to a client population. This infrastructure is operated by an organization that I refer to as the Defender, which monitors the network and may take response actions. In addition, there is an attacker that seeks to intrude on the infrastructure and wants to compromise components. To achieve this, the attacker uses reconnaissance to find vulnerabilities, and then it has to exploit those vulnerabilities in order to gain access. And we study this use case primarily from the defender's perspective down here, where the goal is to find automated strategies for responding to intrusions in real time. Now, this is a long-standing goal in cybersecurity research and a promising approach that is actively investigated currently is the application of decision theoretic and learning based methods to achieve this automation. And that is the topic of my presentation today. This is also the topic of my thesis and something that I've been working on for a few years. And over this time, we have developed a general framework for automated intrusion response, which can be understood on a high level through the following picture. So the starting point here is that we have a target infrastructure. And that simply corresponds to the infrastructure that we want to defend. So this is where we want our defender strategies to be operational in the end. The first step of our method is then that we take the configuration of this infrastructure and we emulate it to create a digital twin. So a virtual replica of the real system. We then use the twin to run experiments and collect measurement data based on which we identify a mathematical model of the system. And then given that model, we apply numerical methods, for example, reinforcement learning to compute optimal response strategies, which we then extract from the simulation environment and evaluate on the twin. And if that evaluation is deemed successful, we may also implement them on the target infrastructure. So that's a high level overview of our framework and also a pretty good outline for the rest of the talk. So I will start by explaining how we create this digital twin. Then I will talk a little bit about system identification. And then most of the talk will be about mathematical modeling and reinforcement learning. The input to our framework is the configuration of the target infrastructure. And here's an example of such a configuration. So it's a bunch of servers, some services, and some vulnerabilities. So a typical IT infrastructure. And the first step in creating a twin of an infrastructure like this is that we have to emulate the physical components, namely the servers, the switches, and the gateways. And we do this using virtual containers. So we map each physical component to a container, and then we run software inside that container to emulate the functionality of the node. So for example, if the physical node is a web server, then we'll run the web server inside the container, etc. Once we have created all of these containers, we then emulate connectivity among the physical nodes by connecting the containers into a network, so a virtual network which runs, typically runs on top of a substrate uh, IP network. We then configure this network to resemble the real network that we're trying to emulate using NetM, which allows us to configure things like packet uh, bit rates, packet loss, delays, jitter, and packet reorderings. Once we have configured the network, we then emulate arrivals of clients using a Poisson process. And we assume that once a client arrives, it will consume one or more services for some period of time, and then it will depart. And we model dependencies here among the services using Markov chains. Finally, we emulate the attacker and the defender inside the twin using an API that allows us to run automated attacks and automated responses inside the twin where attacks include, for example, Nmap scans or port scans, 
reconnaissance, various types of exploits, and brute force attacks. And response actions include shutdowns, redirections, migrations, isolations, and access control. And I would say that this API is really the key functionality of the twin, because it means that we can take a control strategy, possibly computer with reinforcement learning, implement that on the twin, and then run automated attacks against it and measure how well the strategy performs. And then we can improve it and do closed loop uh, learning. If you're interested in more technical details in how we create the twin, or if you want to try it out yourself, everything is available on these links. And my intent is also that at the end of this talk, I will do a demonstration if I have time. But for now, I will leave the digital twin and move on to the next uh, topic. So that's the first step of our framework, where we take the configuration of the target infrastructure and we create this digital twin. And now we will see how we can utilize the twin to identify a mathematical model of the system. There are many ways that we can model intrusion response. We can model it as a parametric optimization problem. We can model it as a dynamic program. We can model it as a game, or we can model it as some kind of evolutionary process. And depending on which model we use, we will have different challenges in terms of validity, scalability, and computational complexity. Our philosophy here is that we should start out with the simplest possible model that we can validate on a real system. And once we get that to work properly, then we can gradually increase the sophistication of our model and make it more realistic. This is a bit orthogonal to most of the related work in this space, where everyone likes to do modeling, but very few actually do go through the effort to validate it on our real system. But in the following, I will talk about our journey in this space, and then I will start from here. So I will start with a very simple model, and then I will show you how we can gradually increase the sophistication and make the model more realistic. So as a starting point, suppose that the attacker follows a fixed strategy and that the defender only has a single response, namely blocking the gateway. In this case, the problem of intrusion response becomes a problem of optimal stopping, where the goal the defender basically observes the infrastructure through a set of metrics, for example, log files or alerts. And while observing these metrics that evolve over time, the defender has to make decisions at each point whether it should continue to monitor or if it should stop and take the response action. More formally, we assume here that the system has an underlying state which is hidden from the defender but the defender instead observes noisy observations of the state. And based on these observations, it has to find the optimal time to take the response. So it wants to find the optimal stopping time, tau, that maximizes some objective. Concretely, we can define this objective to be to stop the intrusion as soon as it has started, but not before that. And we can then define a very simple dynamical system which starts in the healthy state, and at some unknown point in time, we'll transition to the compromised state. And once that transition has occurred, we want to stop the intrusion as soon as possible. The challenge here for the defender is, of course, that it cannot measure the state. It can only observe noisy observations of the state. And we define these observations to be IDS alerts. And here, we utilize the twin to collect measurements of the number of alerts in different states. And based on these measurements, we can then build a probabilistic model of the alerts, which I call SED, so an observation model. And given SED, we can then compute something that we call a belief state, namely the posterior probability of being in a certain state given the history of observations. And since the state is Markov, and the belief is a sufficient statistic of the state, we can then formulate intrusion response as the problem of mapping beliefs to response actions. In a simple case where we only have a single response, 
this problem has a particularly elegant solution, namely a threshold solution. So what this theorem say, states is that the optimal thing for the defender to do is to monitor the infrastructure, collect the alerts, update the belief of intrusion, and when the belief of intrusion reaches some thresholding point alpha, then you should trigger the response. The nice thing about this strategy is that it can be very efficiently implemented in a real system. It's just like 50 lines of code or something that you run on top of your intrusion detection system to decide when to trigger the response. The drawback or the bad thing about this strategy, however, is that it's a bit too simple. So in practice, we do not want to block the gateway whenever we suspect that there's an attack. Ideally, we'd like to respond to the intrusion much before that, before we have to stop block the gateway. So suppose now that the defender can take L response actions instead of one, where L could be in the tens or in the hundreds or even in the thousands. In this case, we have a problem of optimal multiple stopping rather than optimal stopping. And the goal of the defender is to find L stopping time instead of one stopping time. It turns out that we can generalize the theory from the previous slide and prove that in this case, the solution to the stopping problem is a multi-threshold strategy where we have L thresholds instead of one. And these thresholds are decreasing in L where L indicates the number of response actions that you have left. So the more responses you have left, the lower the threshold will be. And as you take responses, the threshold will increase. And in the extreme case, where you only have a single response action left, namely blocking the gateway, then you will have the largest threshold. So that's a lot better than the previous strategy. And depending on how large L is, you can actually have quite sophisticated response strategies of this type. More sophisticated, I would say, than current intuition response systems. But the drawback of this strategy is that it's very exploitable. If the attacker knows that we follow this particular strategy, it can be clever and try to avoid triggering the response. So suppose now that the attacker is dynamic and strategic and knows the defender's strategy and will adapt accordingly and then decide when to start or stop the intrusion depending on the strategy of the defender. In this case, we have an optimal stopping game rather than an optimal stopping problem. And the first thing we can conclude about this game based on our previous analysis is that for any attacker strategy, the best response of the defender is a threshold strategy, multi-threshold strategy. Conversely, for any defender strategy, the best response of the attacker is also a multi-threshold strategy. The difference here is that the attacker has twice the number of thresholds. So it has one set of thresholds for deciding when to start the intrusion and another set of thresholds for deciding when to abort the intrusion. Knowing that there exist best response strategies of this type, we can compute them efficiently by directly parameterizing our strategies with the thresholds and then learning the thresholds using stochastic approximation. So essentially what we do here is that we transform the original dynamic programming problem for computing the best response, which has a huge strategy space, into a parametric problem with a much, much smaller threshold strategy space. This will only give us, however, a best response, which in game theoretic terms is an optimal strategy against a fixed opponent. But in practice, as a defender, we don't know what strategy the attacker will follow. So typically what we want is that we want to find a strategy that maximizes the minimum level of defense that we can guarantee against any attacker. And that corresponds to a maximin strategy, which coincides with a Nash equilibrium since we have a zero sum game. Computing this equilibrium, unfortunately, is intractable. But there exist many algorithms for approximating the equilibrium, which are surprisingly effective in practice. And perhaps the simplest out of all of those is called fictitious play, where both players repeatedly play games against each other. And after each game, they update their strategies to be a best response against the history of play of the opponent. And if they keep doing this long enough, they will eventually reach 
a fixed point where each player plays a best response against each other. And that is by definition a Nash equilibrium. The vertical arrows here correspond to computation of best responses. So that's something that we can do efficiently utilizing algorithm one. And to get this horizontal progression towards the equilibrium here, all we need to do is to iteratively invoke algorithm one. And that means that we can actually approximate an equilibrium of this game using something like 10 lines of code. Now this is pseudo code, so it's a practice a little bit more, but it's still very simple program. And here are some computational results or numerical results. So in the top row, you see the performance in learning the best response. In the bottom row, you see the performance in learning the equilibrium. If you start with the top one, on the y-axis, we have reward that should be maximized. On the x-axis, we have time. And the red curve relates to our algorithm. The blue one is a reinforcement learning baseline. The purple one is a change detection baseline. And the orange one is a dynamic programming baseline. If you run these algorithms long enough and you tune the happy parameters, all of them will eventually converge very near the equilibrium, or sorry, near the best response. The difference is that our algorithm tends to converge faster by exploiting the threshold structure. Similarly, if you look at the bottom plot, here on the y-axis, you have the distance to the equilibrium. And our algorithm is shown in red. The blue one is a deep reinforcement learning fictitious play algorithm. And the purple one is a dynamic programming algorithm. What we can observe is that our algorithm converges near the equilibrium after around one hour of computation and much, much faster than the neural fictitious play algorithm. But we can also see that the dynamic programming algorithm, the purple one, converges almost at the same rate as our algorithm, which is quite surprising considering that this algorithm, HSVI, is known to be quite slow and to be impractical for most games. But in our game, it's actually quite efficient, as we can see. All of these results are simulation results, just to compare the algorithms. And here are the corresponding validation results on the twin. So there's quite a lot of things going on here, but what you should focus on are the red and the blue curves, where the red curve shows the performance of our method in simulation, and the blue one shows the performance on the twin. And we can observe that, in general, the performance is a little bit better in simulation, as expected. So there's a small gap there. But that gap is not that large. That's the encouraging part. And most importantly, the blue curve is strongly correlated with the red curve. And that suggests that the strategies that we learn in simulation transfer their performance to the digital twin. And that gives us confidence that they will also transfer to the target infrastructure. So now we have seen that even if the defender has an arbitrary number of responses, and even if the attacker is dynamic, we can compute the optimal times to take the response actions efficiently. Now we will generalize this even further and consider the case where in addition to deciding when to take the response, we also decide which response to take. And that will lead us into the most general formulation of intuition response. So now we consider that both the attacker and the defender can take L actions per node in the infrastructure. And to have this type of granularity in the response, we need a much more detailed model of the infrastructure than what we had before. And we model the infrastructure now as a directed tree, where every node of this tree corresponds to a virtual component, so a container or a machine, and edges correspond to dependencies among them. And we assume that the infrastructure is segmented into a finite set of zones, each of which has its own access control policy, and every node is part of exactly one zone. But that zone may change over time as a result of defensive actions, which we model with the state of the node, which is a vector with three components. So we have the zone, the intrusion state, and the reconnaissance state. And the complete system state is then the concatenation of all of these vectors, which I denote with S. And that is a realization of the random vector, capital S, which is dynamic in the sense that it evolves over time 
according to a transition function f. Now the nodes of the infrastructure, they run services that are connected into what we call workflows. And here a workflow is simply an abstraction that we use to model a set of nodes that are dependent in some way. So a typical example of a workflow may be a chain of microservices. These microservices, we capture them in the model as subtrees of the infrastructure tree. And this leads me into our main assumption in the model. And that is that every node is part of exactly one workflow. And it turns out that this assumption is very convenient because it means that the set of workflows induces a partitioning of the set of nodes, such that CalV is a non-overlapping union of CalV subscript W, where W is the workflow. And I will utilize this property later on to prove a decomposition theorem. Now the, no the workflows are consumed by clients and these interactions with the clients and the workflows generate a lot of traffic on the network, which the defender observes through intrusion detection systems that generate alert vectors, OT, where each component of OT corresponds to the number of alerts for a given node at a given time. And OT is distributed according to some joint distribution Z. We make really no assumption about Z, but we assume that Z exists and that we can estimate it from data. And again, we do this estimation using the digital twin. So we have 64 nodes in our target infrastructure and therefore we have 64 distributions here. I've aggregated the distributions so that in red, you see the distribution during normal operation and in blue, you see the distribution during an attack. What we can observe is that there's quite a lot of false alarms. That's why the distributions overlap. But still, there's a pretty good signal in detecting the attack on every node. And based on this signal, we consider that the defender can take four types of response actions. So it can migrate nodes between zones. It can block or redirect flows. It can shut down nodes and it can do access control. When deciding between these actions, the defender considers the entire history of observations, which is why we define a defender strategy to be a mapping from the history space to a distribution over the action space. And in selecting this strategy, the goal of the defender is to balance two conflicting objectives. So on the one hand, it wants to maintain services to its clients. And on the other hand, it wants to quickly respond to a possible intrusion. Similarly, we define, we just consider that the attacker can take three types of offensive actions for every node, namely reconnaissance, brute force attacks, and code execution attacks. Just like the defender, we define an attack strategy to be a mapping from the history space. And we assume that the attacker, the objective of the attacker is diametrically opposed to the defender, such that the attacker not only wants to compromise nodes, it also wants to deny service to clients. And this means that we can formulate intrusion response problem as a zero sum game where the maximizing player is the defender and the minimizing player is the attacker. This is a particular type of game called a partially observed stochastic game, which I denote with gamma, capital gamma. And the first thing that we can state regarding this game is that there exists a solution. So the game has a value. And furthermore, for any opponent strategy, there always exists the best response. That's the good news. The bad news is that computing this solution is intractable for any non-trivial instantiation of the game. And the reason for this is that the spaces of the game grow exponentially with the number of nodes. So even when you only have a handful of nodes, you run into this combinatorial explosion, which makes the game intractable to solve. And this is clearly a big challenge for us because we have a target infrastructure with 64 nodes. And to tackle this challenge, we will use decomposition which I will talk about next. Before I give you the details of this decomposition, let me give you the high level intuition. And that is that the high computational complexity of the game 
stems from the interconnectivity among all of the nodes. That is what causes the combinatorial explosion and makes the game intractable. But intuitively, the optimal action for me as a defender on a node here, say node number seven, does not directly depend on the state of a node down here, even though they are connected in some sense. So they are not completely independent either, but there's a certain type of conditional independence here that we will exploit such that we can break this very, we can basically isolate certain decision problems in the network from each other and thereby break this very high dimensionality. And we will do this in three steps. So first we'll see how we can decompose the game on the workflow level into a set of additive sub games one for each workflow that are independent. Then we will recursively decompose each of those subgames into node level subgames with optimal substructure. And finally, we'll see that each of those node level subgames can be solved efficiently utilizing threshold properties. So the intuition behind the first step is that if there are two nodes in infrastructure and there is no path in between them, then they are independent in the following informal sense that I will make formal on the next slide. So if the attacker attacks one of the nodes, that will have no impact on the state of the other node. And that should be very intuitively clear because there's no reason if you run a command on one node in infrastructure, why that would change the state of a completely different node. Secondly, if the attacker is successful in compromising the node, that won't make it any easier or harder for the attacker to compromise the other node, since they are isolated. So more formally, we're talking about two types of independences here, namely transition independence and utility independence. So we say that a set of nodes are transition independent if the transition probability is factorized like this. Similarly, we say that a set of nodes are utility independent if we can rewrite the joint utility function as a function of the local utilities, which is such that if you maximize the local utilities, you also maximize the global utility. And a remark here is that if you have two decision problems that are both transition and utility independent, then they are completely independent and we can solve them in parallel. And that's typically what we want. Now it turns out that for the game as we have defined it, all of the nodes are actually transition independent. And if there's no path in between two nodes, then they're also utility independent. And I claim that these types of independencies hold for many practical IT infrastructures. We didn't really need to make any strong assumptions in order to arrive at these independencies. They may not always hold in practice, but I think they hold in many, many uh, scenarios. And a direct corollary of this is that we can decompose our game into a set of sub games, one for each workflow that we can solve in parallel that are independent. The second step of the decomposition is a little more challenging because the nodes within the same workflow are utility dependent. So you see an example infrastructure here to the right where we have three nodes, two of them are in the same workflow and the third one is in a separate workflow. The arrow from one to two means that the service provided by node one depends on the service of node two. So this means that if the defender would put the defensive action on node number two, say shut it down, that would then clearly impact the service of node one and thus the utility. Hence they are utility dependent. On the, other one, if you, on the other hand, if you shut down node number two, that will have no impact on the service by node three and no impact on the utility. So they're utility independent. This dependence between one and two means that we cannot just treat them in isolation. That won't give us an optimal, globally optimal solution. However, it turns out that there is a certain type of transformation that we can do here to the game transform it to another equivalent game where these two nodes are transition or utility independent. And the idea behind this uh, transformation is that we can redefine the utility functions so that they become utility independent. So we know that the, the state of node two will impact the utility of node one. 
So therefore we define the utility function here to take those dependencies into account and to make them utility independent. And I won't give the details of this algorithm here since it's a bit detailed, but it's available in our paper. And um, there's also a full proof of the trans transformation there. But that transformation essentially means that we now have a scalable approach to solve the game where we can decompose it into these work uh, node level subgames. And that gives us very close to linear scalability. So if we have 10 nodes, then we may use 10 parallel processors. If we have 64 nodes, then we may use 64 parallel processors. And on each of those processors, we solve the local subgame for a given node. And that can be done efficiently by utilizing certain uh, threshold properties. And this is very similar to what we saw earlier in this talk in the stopping case. The only difference here is that the local state of a node now in this game can be in three different attack states. It can be healthy, compromised, or discovered. Previously, we only had a healthy and compromised states. So in that case, the belief space was just a line, a unit interval from zero to one. In this case, we have a two-dimensional belief space, namely this triangle, the equilateral triangle. And this means that we don't have a single threshold, but rather we have a threshold curve or a switching curve that partitions the space into two regions, one region where it's optimal to wait and another region where it's optimal to trigger the response. And this curve can, the intuition for why there exists such a curve is that in this belief space, we can draw lines that go from the left corner. And on each of those lines, following from the previous theorem, we know that there must be a threshold on that line since the beliefs on the line are totally ordered. And since we can fill the entire simplex with these lines, we have an infinite number of thresholds. And if we connect them together, we get a curve. And that is what we call the switching curve. And this curve can be efficiently estimated by uh, stochastic approximation, very similar to the algorithm one that we saw earlier in the talk. Apart from that, we use exactly the same principle to approximate the equilibrium. The only difference now is that when we compute the best responses, we use this whole decomposition first. And here are some results. So the leftmost plot here is the most interesting. It shows the convergence to the equilibrium, both in simulation and on the twin. And what we can observe is that we converge very near the equilibrium after around 100 hours of computation. We do not fully converge. And I speculate that the reason for this is that there is some inherent approximation errors in our algorithm. In, in particular, when we compute the best responses here, we don't actually compute the exact best response. We just compute an approximate best response. And I think that is what means, that is what causes this, that we don't fully converge to zero exploitability and to the equilibrium. Nonetheless, if we compare it to a state-of-the-art fictitious play algorithm, we find that our algorithm converges much faster and is much more reliable in general. To conclude, in our work, we develop a framework for automated intrusion response. And this framework centers around a digital twin of the target infrastructure, which we use to collect data and to evaluate strategies. And to obtain the strategies to evaluate, we formulate the use case as a stochastic game between the defender and the attacker, and we approximate an equilibrium of this game using fictitious play. Thank you very much for listening. And as a, to end this talk, I will do a short demo of our framework, as I promised. So this is the landing page of the framework. Mostly when we work with the framework, we actually do it through uh, APIs in Python and on command line interface. But for demonstration purposes, I will just focus on the web interface for now. So here we click on the emulations page, we can see the, or I have to log in. On the emulations page, we can see the list of digital twins that we have registered on the platform. So these are basically configurations of target infrastructure and instructions on how we can create a digital twin. And if you use the platform, then you can register your own configuration here to emulate 
exactly the type of configuration that you want for your purposes. And we can see that we currently have one emulation that is running. It's a very small emulation that I created just before this talk. So it has only five nodes. And here we can find a lot of metadata about the emulation or about the, the twin. So the list of containers, the services that are run by the containers, the vulnerabilities, the resources, so how much RAM and CPUs are allocated to every container, details about the network and network conditions, so the capacities and the uh, packet loss probabilities and so on. And for example, the commands used to emulate the clients, et cetera. Similarly, if we go to the simulations page, we can see similar metadata about all of the simulations. So recall our framework that we have digital twin and on top of that, we have the simulations. So here we have, for example, the stopping game that we talked about earlier. And we can see some metadata about that. We have two players, the defender and attacker. State space is just very small. We have three states, intrusion and no intrusion. Action spaces, both players have only two actions, stop and continue. And we can also inspect, the, for example, the observation distribution. So here's the distribution during normal operation. And here's the distribution during an attack. We can also inspect the transition probability of the game to the transition kernel. So we can see, depending on which action you take, what will be the probability of the next state. Similarly, we can inspect the reward function, which depends on both players, actions of both players and the state. So we have the state here on the x-axis. And then we have this page called monitoring, which is a very useful page that I use a lot. So typically what I do is that when I start an experiment on the twin and then run some attacks or maybe some response strategies to evaluate them, then I go to this page to monitor the digital twin in real time. So now I've fetched the latest 15 minutes of data. And we can see here uh, different types of uh, metrics. So here we have the alerts, here we have the CPU utilization, network load, number of processes, login events, number of clients, connections, etc. And you can also view metrics per container if you want that. Then we have the traces page. So we have emulation traces where we collect all of the traces or episodes that we run on Digital Twin. We collect them and store them so that we can do offline analysis and analytics uh, later on. So an attacker trace includes, oh, sorry, an trace includes a list of attacker actions. So here we have the continue action first, then we have a ping scan, here's the command. We have an exploit here, installing tools, another scan, more exploits, etc. And similarly for the defender, the list of actions. And we can also look at the metrics, so what the defender observes at every time step. And we can see that we collect quite a lot of metrics here. And the most important one is typically the uh, snort alerts. We can also view metrics per machine by looking at changing here. As well as the attacker observation. So when the attacker does reconnaissance, what type of nodes does it discover? and the compromise nodes as well. And then we have a page called statistics where we aggregate uh, basically counters or the statistic basically counting statistics from the digital twin about the number of occurrences of different events. And then based on those counters, we can then fit empirical distributions of different types of uh, metrics. And see, this is quite a large data set where we collected 300,000 samples, almost, which corresponds to running the digital twin for several months to collect that amount of data, because each sample takes at least a minute to collect, usually. So we can look at different uh, conditions here, basically different types of commands or actions that we want to look at the distribution given that condition. For now, I'll just look, do the simple thing and look at intrusion and no intrusion. And we can look at diff many different metrics here as well. So for example, alerts weighted by priority. And here we see the corresponding distributions. For uh, number of clients, 
There's a more of a Gaussian shape for uh, login events or failed. Based on these statistics, we can now fit something that we call system models. So we can, this is what we have used in our case. For example, we can fit a Gaussian mixture model to the distributions based on the counters that I just showed you. And this is an example of a Gaussian mixture model that we have trained with expectation maximization. We also have a page called policy examination, which allows us to debug policies or strategies that we have learned which means that we can basically step through a scenario or a trace and inspect what the strategy is doing. So what kind of actions is it taking and uh, how is it responding to different types of attacks? So here in the bottom, you see the metrics that we collect. Here you see the belief of the defender as well as the probability of taking a defensive action. And on the right, you see the progression of the attack. You can see that now the attack started and the attack the attacker is making progress on the right side. And we can see that now the belief is steadily increasing for the defender and also the probability of a defensive action. Yes, then we also have, so we can look at all training results. All of this is stored in the platform as well. So reinforcement learning training, we can go back and look at various plots of the training progress and the standard deviations. So the average return, for example. And we also can monitor or also store all of the policies that we train. So we have many different types of policies. Now we'll talk a lot about in this presentation about threshold policies, which are the simplest one. We just can define a policy by single values. But we also have more sophisticated policies like neural network policies, for example, like PPO policies and so on. Now I don't have an example here to show, but uh, the system supports that as well. And we also have jobs, which allows us to monitor. We have three types of jobs. So we can monitor training jobs, which corresponds to reinforcement learning training, data collection jobs, which corresponds to collecting data from the twin, and system identification jobs, which corresponds to fitting models to the data that we collect. And um, I think that was about it that I want to show. The final thing I can show is the control plane. So we also have some interfaces here for managing the whole framework while it is running or debugging a digital twin. So here we have details about a twin that is running currently. And you can see the containers and their statuses. You can also view the log files if you want, what's going on there. And uh, we also have a lot of management services here that we can start or stop from this interface like uh, different scripts that we use to run the attacks and collect data and do monitoring, etc. And packet beats and so on for collecting data and uh, storing it in Elastic. We can also open a shell to a container. So if we pick a container here, for example, the hacker container, then we can click here. And then we can actually connect the container from the web interface here. And here we can run arbitrary commands or debug what is going on. We can look at the processes, for example, for the uh, system utilization. So that was a short demo of the platform, just yes, from the web interface. But you can find everything on the links that are provided in the slides and more details. And of course, most of this interaction with the framework is done through Python APIs and the command line interface rather than the web interface. But the web interface is useful just for monitoring things while things are running on the system. So thank you very much for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions about the platform.